Y'all doing good? Good. So we're going to continue our Bible study from, maybe I need to move this. We will be in a second. Um, is that better? All right. Um, so tonight we're going to continue our Bible study from last week. And I'm hoping that with having a panel discussion tonight that it will give, give you the ability through our discussion um, to give you, last week I feel like I gave you the what. And the what is, this don't feel like it's uh, maybe adjusted right. The last week was what scripture memorization is about. Tonight, I want to give you more of how. So last week, we talked about Psalm 119.11, you know, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We talked about keep this book of the law before you and all of those things. Tonight, hopefully, with... Uh, our panel, so I'm have them introduce themselves, and then, based off of some pre-written questions that they've had a chance to review, we'll work our way through those, and perhaps, you saying something, Ron? Make sure your mic's on. Check. Check. Okay. So, Check. Yes. So we're going to work our way through, well, what does, what does it look like? And hopefully from the panel, um, we will have you all at a place where you're walking away saying, okay, I think I understand memorizing scripture even better. Yes. Um, what we're going to do is I'm a, I have a handful of questions that I've already predetermined that I'm going to work through, and then based on how much we do with the questions that we already have, I will then uh, entertain the other questions. So if you can like make a list of what the questions are, then hopefully time will permit um, that, that we'll be able to get to those two. All right. So... Um, I will start with the lady to my left, if you will introduce yourself. I'm to, uh, First Lady, Minister First Lady Talita Grayton, Southern Friendship. All right, and I will have you tell me just a little bit, perhaps, about 
um, what scripture memorization has meant to you? It has meant um, being more obedient because when I first became a Christian, I was very green. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know anything about the Lord um, until I knew that I didn't want to go to hell. And then I gave my life to Christ and um, just started going to church. And the biggest thing that helped me was our church started offering uh, discipleship classes. And the very first class was survival kit. So right now I'm putting in a serious, shameless, unadulterated plug for survival kit because that particular class made me memorize scripture. We were held accountable. We were given quizzes. We were given tests. So as a new Christian, of course, I'm trying to navigate life, trying to be Christ-like and still have the pull of the world. Having to memorize those scriptures helped me in those tempting situations because one of the first scriptures, it might be the very first one, was Psalm 119 verse 11. That's in survival kit and so that word have I had in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So it helped me to avoid sin. You know, when I was tempted to do something, that scripture would come up in my spirit, in my mind. I don't want to sin against God. I don't want to sin. So that's what it's the biggest thing it helps me to do, not to sin against God and to be um and I'm being held accountable by his word. Okay. Next, introduce yourself. My name is Deacon James A. Robinson. And uh, what got me into learning the word of God and applying the word of God to me was people questioning me. And I knew I had to learn of him first. And I had to learn of him first to uh, understand you know, my first scripture that I really uh, started studying was uh, James 1 and 5. If any man lack of wisdom, ask of God. So ever since I started learning that scripture, I said, that's how I'm going to learn how to learn scripture and apply scripture to my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for, like, Bible studies and Sunday schools and men's ministry any tool that I can use to learn more about Scripture and the Word of God, that's how I started off. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Deacon Tim Harris. And I would say as far as learning Scripture, what it helped me to learn was that I wasn't in charge of my life there. Everything that I accomplished, um, and notice I put the word I, that's the way I was thinking at the time, until I hit a snag in my life. I hit rock bottom for a little bit. And that's when I learned, hey, look, it's not me, it's God to control. And on that very same note, one of the first passages of Scripture I learned was uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Matter of fact, that's in my uh, email um, signature block there. And I learned it under the NASB, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge and he will make your path straight. Now, I know there's uh, the different versions, it's uh, direct your paths and so forth. But it definitely helped me to understand that no, everything I had accomplished to that point when I had hit rock bottom, that was not me. That was God's grace. So definitely it helped me understand that. Okay. Good. Um, when you think about memorizing scripture, what are the effective strategies or techniques for memorizing scripture that you have used the most? Any of them? Me, it comes from a uh, just studying the Word of God, you know, faith come by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. Yes, Romans ten seventeen. Right. And I listen to a lot of pastors like uh, David Jeremiah, Jack Graham, Tony Evans, Pastor Graydon, <laughs> Pastor Fields. Mm -hmm. When he was here, you got to be hungry for the Word. Blessed are those who thirst after righteousness. Yeah. 
And, you know, once you thirst after righteousness and his word, everything should fall in place with you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added on to you. You know, so that's how I feel about that. Okay. Okay, I'll go next. Um, definitely to kind of echo what First Lady was saying uh, as far as the discipleship classes. And I'm definitely going to agree with her as far as with the uh, survival kit. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I echo what she's saying in terms of taking that course. I encourage each and every one of you all to take that because you're going to learn a lot of scripture. But I'm also going to add one more to that, actually two more. Uh, Jesus on leadership. And I went through with Pastor, and I'm going to tell you all, he drilled us quite a bit. We had to learn quite a bit of scripture. I think there were some, somewhere along maybe seven or eight different uh, uh, scriptures we had to learn. Also, I'm going to add one more to that, uh, Master Life. Uh, Master Life, I'm going to tell you there's four modules there, and you're going to go through a big drill as far as like learning scripture. So I would definitely encourage you to take all any and all classes that you can take, because that's going to kind of put you in an environment where you're going to learn scripture. Also, um, I have, I don't know how many of you all have the uh, Bible app on your phone. Uh, each day they give you a Bible verse, a verse of the day. Uh, that'll help you, that'll go a long way and help you to learn scripture as well. Um, I think a few techniques are, Pastor mentioned a few of them last week, writing them on index cards and keeping them with you and putting them around the house, having scripture around the house, um, getting an accountability partner. You know, that's the classes will definitely help with the accountability. And if you have some, well, because we know, we all know on our own, we'll jump in, jump out, do some, not do some. But if you have someone that's checking on you, oh, yeah. you're going to get it done. And so having an accountability partner, being in the classes and, um, that's and as Tim said. When you're reading the the on the Bible app, constantly, constantly reading the Word of God, and it's the big, the big greatest thing is when you start memorizing Scripture, and then you're in a preaching or teaching setting, and the preacher or teacher starts quoting a Scripture, and you can quote it right along with them. That just feels so good when you can do that, and you're like. It's in my heart. I know it, you know, and that just puts a big smile in your heart and on your face to know that, yeah, I'm starting to memorize scripture. So, yeah, putting it on index cards, putting it in your car, on your dashboard, as you're driving, you're reading it. So those are definitely some techniques that you can use. Another one is uh, just taking regular notebook paper. And... If you're learning, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I'm going to, as I'm trying to learn that verse, write as much of it as I can without looking. So all I might be able to write is trust in the Lord with all your heart. I'm going to say, okay, well, how much can I write down? That's all I can write down. Fine. Next, I'm going to go back and look at it. And then every time I'm trying to write more, and I'm thinking by the time I get down the front of a sheet, whole sheet of notebook paper and down the back of a sheet of notebook paper, I know that verse. But this is every day. This isn't, I looked at it on Monday. I looked at it again on Thursday. You know, this is, I looked at it Monday morning. I looked at it again Monday afternoon. I looked at it Monday night. I looked at it again Tuesday, and I'm looking at it and working on memorizing this. So if I drive, as I'm pulling up to a red light, I'm not just sitting here thinking about when the light gonna change. I'm studying this verse while, while I got a red light. I'm on the train, I'm studying this verse, right? Because now I'm trying to do all I can to lock it into memory. And, um, Another one is if you're learning it with someone else, then you're using the other person to quiz and to say, how much of it do you know? And so they become an accountability partner because um, you don't want that person to feel let down that they're learning it, but you're not. Yeah. Now, um, as a teacher, I'll just tell you uh, this. I do know that peer pressure works. Most of us 
are going to respond when it comes to peer pressure. So I'd simply have somebody who's helping me with it. And if I do well, you did a good job. But I don't do well, and I'm going to cut my hands and boo. <laughs> you know, if you, right, it works. It, it seems silly that getting booed, but you get booed on Monday, you get booed again on Wednesday, they're not going to get booed on Friday. So it's, it's a good pressure to make a person say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do what I can to get this verse uh, locked into memory. Hey, Pastor, before you go on, can I, can I make one more comment on the, uh, the peer pressure? Uh, I'm looking in the back there, and, and I see one of my fellow walkers there, uh, Deaconess Edna Morse. Now, most of you all may or may not know this, but her nickname is Drill Sergeant. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it's Drill Sergeant for a reason, <laughs> because she would catch us around the church here, or she would call up, hey, how you doing? Hey, uh, tell me what uh, John 424 says. <laughs> Huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a uh, wife pressure. She knew this was coming. You know, I, I'll, I'll share a quick story. My, my, while I was going through studying uh, to become a deacon, and I had just finished a grueling session with my fellow walkers, and I went, and my wife let me get all the way into bed and pull the covers up and so forth. And she says, "Pop quiz." I'm like, "Pop who?" <laughs> <laughs> And there was no shame in her game, but no, she, she loved me enough to uh, push me hard to learn uh, the scripture and all 147 questions, I think they were on the catechism yeah. packet. Yeah, well, good, good. So consistency can be a challenge. How, what, what would you recommend for individuals? What, what would you give them to say, this is how you can maintain consistency in memorizing scripture. You will be consistent if you do what? I would say incorporate it as a part of your quiet time. I mean, if you have that quiet time in the morning or whenever you do your quiet time, I would say incorporate it as a part of that. If you're spending 20 minutes uh, praying and so forth, hey, add another five minutes uh, to uh, memorize your scripture. and go gotcha. yeah. With me, uh, I love listening to the prayer line on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And like the day Minister Java was in Ezra, chapter 1, verses, I think, was 64 to 69. And every time he does scripture, I go back. And uh, matter of fact, I'm going to let you all know, I'm really totally blind in my right eye. But that don't stop me. Mm -hmm. And I have partial vision in my left, but that don't stop me. Because I know the word of God says in uh, Luke one thirty seven, all things is possible through God. So my phone, I use it a lot where I can open my letters up wide and read and uh, have God minister to me. But uh, that uh, prayer line and uh, devotion on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is, is really deep. And uh, that's what I love about studying the Word of God. My quiet time comes when I get up out of the morning thanking God as I put my feet on, on the ground. Like yesterday, my wife was doing the praying. She did the praying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I said, well, okay, I ain't, you know. So once I did finish the praying, I went downstairs in my little cave, you know, and I listened to the uh, 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 the Bible, the uh, the prayer line. And once I go from the prayer line, I open my phone up and I start to read. So the more you read, the more you be able to memorize scripture. Now I am saying I'm not a Bible scholar or nothing. When I get up there at the podium and I don't have my Bible because I study my scripture before I know. When they tell me, hey, I want you to do scripture. So you got to be prepared. Yeah. yeah. So preparing is a good thing of learning how to do scriptures, preparing yourself. Okay. Um, I think also oh, if, you, oh, if you set an alarm in your phone, maybe, you know, morning, noon, and night, you know, read, your, read over your scripture. Just set an alarm so that it reminds you because we know life gets in the way and we, by the time we think about it, we probably sitting in the bed or under the covers and then you're going to fall asleep. But I think if you set an alarm um, in the morning, sometime during the day and then at night to um, either just read it or as pastor just said, you know, to start writing it down, to write, you know, a full sheet. And then, you know, I think that's a good tool. I think the, the writing has been documented that 
writing is attached to memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, studies have shown that if you type something compared to if you write it, you don't remember what you typed. Mm -hmm. But there's something about a pen to paper or a pencil on paper, and the more you write it, the more you're going to memorize it. So it, it may seem uh, the long way, old fashioned, but I promise you, if you're trying to memorize scripture, just getting in a habit of writing it out until you can get it as much as possible. The second thing I would say is what verse, how do you choose which verses you're going to memorize? Right, right. I'm just picking stuff that I'm reading. So I'm reading my Bible, this verse jumps out at me, and I determine I'm going to learn that verse. It could be that I was taking classes, and because I was taking the class, you know, uh, the, the class says you're going to learn Psalm uh, 119, verse 105. You, you, don't, you don't have a choice in that, right? So there's sometimes when there's someone else telling you, what you're going to memorize. But then there are other times, because you are reading your Bible on a regular basis, this verse jumps out to you. And because this verse just speaks to me, I'm now saying I'm going to commit that verse uh, to memory. It may be something the preacher preached. It may be something we covered in Bible study. And now, because that verse really spoke to me, I'm saying I'm going to memorize that. That verse that I'm going to memorize may be speaking to a place where I am in my life. So um, as my wife talked about, we were very young when we came into the church. It's uh, amazing now that it's 33 years later that, that we're walking with the Lord. Um, but I remember as young 20-something-year-old believers following Jesus, how difficult it was. I never want to forget how hard it was walking in discipline back then. So those verses that challenged me to live discipline, those were the verses that I was memorizing. When my flesh was all over the place, in Galatians 5, 16, right. challenges me specifically right. to walk in the Spirit. All right now. And you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. Of the flesh. Mm -hmm. this, this is night and day. Either you're going to fulfill the lust of your flesh, which means you're walking in your flesh, or you're going to walk in the spirit. And I'm praying, help me, God, to walk in the spirit before I walk out this house. I don't know what I'm going to see, but if I'm prepared now to walk in the spirit, mm -hmm. I won't be in the flesh. Right? Amen. Um, so it is... Part of that, I would say, is putting yourself in a position where memorizing scripture, as they have said, is just part of what I do. I get up, I go to worship on Sunday morning, I come to Bible study on Wednesday night, um, I'm praying and reading my Bible in the morning, and I have a routine of what I do. Memorizing scripture is a discipline as a believer that's just a part of the rest of my life. There are things as a believer that I'm expected to do and I expect to do. Not only is it expected of me, but I expect it of me. Amen. So memorizing scripture and which scriptures am I going to memorize? So you may be a mother and there's a verse that speaks to you as a mother. You may be a wife. There's a verse that speaks to you. It may be that because you're a husband or because you're a man. That verse is speaking to me. I'm going to memorize that verse. And that's the process of um, beginning um, to do that. And I want to encourage you that it's not, it's not impossible because there's so many people who have memorized scripture. It may feel that way when you first start determining, all right, I'm going to start committing scripture to memory. But I want to challenge you about you don't feel daunted when you learn a new song and you go, I wonder, wonder what is Fred Hammond actually saying? And so you start rewinding it and doing whatever else or 
yeah, looking up the lyrics on the internet, trying to figure out what is he saying and all of that kind of stuff. And you keep doing it, um, unless you're one of those hard hit people that know the lyrics is wrong, but that's the way you've been singing, singing it for the last six months. So you keep singing it your way, even though you know it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's, I would say you just have to make it part of your discipline. It's dis it takes discipline to pray. It takes discipline to read scripture, discipline to live holy. It takes discipline to memorize scripture. You know, um, you know I'm memorizing that scripture. Galatians. You, you going to memorize that one? <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, I, I got a meaning out of that. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so in what ways does scripture memorization enhance a person's ability to witness their faith to others and um, to do apologetics in the Christian faith? I would say it's, um, it definitely enhances because you don't have to search for the scriptures. You don't know how much time you're going to have with, with this particular person. I think it's almost, you know how they say, what is it called, an elevator speech? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you really have to have that because you don't know how much time you're going to have with someone when you're witnessing. So you don't have to have your Bible in your pocket and say, okay, let's go to Romans, yeah. you know, chapter, you know, 3, verse 23. You know, you, it's already in your heart. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say that there's um, an app. Um, what's the name of the app? When you're witnessing the people. I don't know why. It, I just had it in Share my faith. mind. Share faith. And that makes it a little easier. But and then even then, when the scripture is there, is always a great witness to someone, even if the scripture is there, but yet you're able to quote it because they know, I believe that they know that you're sincere and that you have spent time in the word and you know what you're talking about. Right. So you're saying you hand the person that you're witnessing to your phone. They're looking at Romans 3.23, but you're quoting it. Or you're looking together, maybe, but you're, and it's on the screen, but you're quoting it. You're not reading it off the screen. You're quoting it. You're looking at them saying the scripture, even though it's on the screen. And uh, so that's what I try to do when we take people back as altar workers. Even though the information is right there, I'm trying to look them in the eye and be interactive and quote the scripture, you know, right to them. So that they know that, you know, as I said, they have an idea that, yes, this person knows this and they mean what they're saying. And I think it puts a lot of validity onto the word as well when you know it um, by heart. Okay. I had an encounter last week with a Jehovah Witness. And before they got to talk, I talked. I said, first, let me let you know I'm a believer in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus Christ is God. Then I went with the scriptures. I went with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And, and the Word was God. And I thought about when pastors say about their Bible, their Bible says a God. Am I correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. So I got them, got them straight first, and then I went with Acts 4 and 12, neither is salvation under the name under heaven, where we must be saved. Mm -hmm. And once I started running the scriptures down to him, one person was looking at the Bible and they hand what I was saying there. And the other person was, was just looking at me. So then she came and said, well, I see that you believe in God. Can I give you this? I said, no, you can't give me that. <laughs> the reason why I said that is because Galatians 1 and 9 talk about any other preaching that come to you that's not under them. I'm going to be condemned. Mm -hmm. So the lady said, well, we're going to send some men back down here to talk to you. <laughs> and uh, and they'll, they'll talk with you. So I stayed on my porch. They came down, and they went straight on up the street. <laughs> <laughs> and I did you. that, not bragging on myself, yeah, but yeah. you have to know the scriptures, tell the truth, because the truth shall set you free. That's, That's right. right. So... They just kept on up the street. Mm -hmm. So I guess they said, don't go over there. Right. That ad, that <laughs> yeah. They crossed that so, address yeah. off their list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, back then. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you have to have that word in your heart. Mm -hmm. 
even though you have to, as Pastor was saying, Psalm 119, 11, that word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against me. You have to have the word. Like I say, you know, I just study and keep reading as God leads me to these things, you know. So that was one of my encounters of witnessing to a Jehovah witness about my God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He is God. And the good part about it is you don't have to be on the defensive. Yeah. You're not in a place where you're letting them control the conversation. There you go. Because back. you have a, 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 a storage, a well of scripture in you mm -hmm. where you can say, um, I'm going to control part of this conversation. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And, you know, right, I'm not going to be in a place where I don't know anything, so I got to take whatever you're saying. Right. That, that I'm not going to be in that position, so that's a really good point. Yeah, right. they know, what, you know what right. you're talking about, right. what you what, mean. what right. came in my head was what he said at a yeah. Bible study here. A God, no. God is three, Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Who I would have to go last, right? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I will add a, just maybe a teensy bit more to what uh, uh, Deacon James has said and, and also uh, Minister Toledo has said. Uh, I was put into a, a position recently in terms of with the writing a devotional. And this is for uh, Lent. And all the verses I wanted to do on grace, everybody had taken those. I was like one of the last people, so I'm like... Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go find something else. Mm -hmm. And the verse that I came across was Titus 2.11, which is an excellent uh, witnessing piece there. Uh, you know, for God's grace has appeared, uh, granting salvation to all people. And if you look at that verse and what it says, and you get somebody that you encounter, and they might tell you, well, hey, I've done too much dirt. Or, you know, you might have somebody sitting on the other side, oh, no, that pro, he, oh, he's not getting into heaven. No, he's, no, he's beyond saving. You know, you can use that verse as a witnessing piece, and then you can tell people, like I can tell people by myself, hey, look, this verse here, this exemplifies me. You know, he granted salvation to me, without a doubt, so. Yeah, good. Um, how can scripture memorization contribute to overcoming challenges and temptations in daily life? Mm. Um, one, one of the verses that I, I learned, matter of fact, Pastor, you helped me with this one. This is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13, uh, where, where it talks about uh, you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, uh, God will provide a way out. And the phrase that I use with that is, in case of emergency, break glass. Uh, definitely store that verse in your heart there, because it's, if you're in those situations there, and you can sit back and think, hey, look. This is not going to kill me here. This, this, you know, this is just something temporary. You know, I can get out of this. There's a way out somewhere. Where, where's the exit? You know, kind of like when you're on an airplane and the flight attendant is up there describing, um, you know, look for the nearest exit. Keep in mind the nearest exit may be behind you, right? That verse has helped me and continues to help me to look for that way out if I'm tempted to sin. Good. Another one, uh, Romans uh, 8 1. Especially if you're dealing with being condemned, feeling guilty. Uh, Romans 8 1, there is therefore now no condemn condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. This constantly letting that verse minister to me to say, Yeah, I messed up yesterday. I asked God for forgiveness yesterday. There's no reason for me to be walking around feeling guilty if I asked for forgiveness and God answers and gives me, grants me forgiveness based off of me asking for it. Although I messed up yesterday, this guilt, I need to throw that away. I don't have to be guilty. So having that, and, and I'm saying this from the place of, it's easy to look polished 30 something years later. I'm remembering them years when I'm trying to get free. Any, anybody remember that? I know you good and saved now. You holy. You got it all together. You look polished. I'm talking about when we were trying to get delivered. Right? Cried after. You, you remember them times when you, you messed up and then you cried like a baby because you messed up and you did what God, you knew you weren't supposed to do it and you did it and how broken you were. And then the enemy rides you with guilt. 
and you supposed to be this, and you supposed to be, and how could you, and all that. It's like, man, there is no condemnation on me. I'm saved. Yeah. I'm in Christ Jesus. Get off my back. But memorizing scripture uh, did that for me, Help, helped me to know that even when I messed up, that the God I serve um, would, would not continue to hold that against me after I have repented and asked for forgiveness. And I love the scripture when I was, you know, coming up as a, you know, new babe and trying, as pastor just said, trying to be delivered from so much. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's, um, that was a chastising scripture for me. I had to always be mindful that to make sure that I'm in Christ keep that at the forefront of my mind, and then to know that to speak those things that, that they're going to be new. All things are become new. It may not look new, but thank you, Lord, that it's, going, that it's going to be new because I'm going to allow you to do whatever you need to do in my life so that I am new. I don't want to be that old person I right, used to right. be. I want to be a new creature in Christ. So committing that verse to memory definitely helped me to always be mindful that I want to be new. I want to be clean. I don't want a red spot on my white shirt. I want my white shirt to be clean. So um, that definitely helped. Uh, I like that verse that First Lady just said, too, because when I got saved and was going to my wife Godfather's church and I joined the church and I got saved, so one of our high school friends met up with my wife, and she told him about me. And the dude said, him? Not him. <laughs> you mean him? So my wife just kept saying, yeah, he's saved. And uh, I got changed from the ways that I was. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I was a drug dealer. I'm not ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. I was a drug dealer. I, I smoked. I drank. I used drugs. And uh, when people didn't pay me, I was scrapped, and I pulled it out. Hey, what mm -hmm. you I'm just telling you how I was. Mm -hmm. But thank God I was changed. Yeah. Amen. I Amen. was changed. Amen. And uh, I thank God I was changed because I know the, the scripture said that the Apostle Paul said he was the, the worst of all sinners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if he can change, why can't I change? Yeah. That's right. So I changed my whole lifestyle around. I see how much better it was. Mm -hmm. I see how much better it was in my marriage and my relationship with my wife. Because I almost, I'm, I'm telling you, I almost lost my family for what I was doing. Mm. Yeah. But thanks be to God, it was a whole turnaround. Yeah. You know, and I'm not ashamed. People ask me, well, how did you stop? And how did you? I say, I went to the throne of grace. Yes. I'm saying, ask for mercy on me. Yeah. Yes, yes. There is a God in yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, I want you to quote whatever is one of the favorite verses that you've memorized. Definitely for me, it's uh, Proverbs uh, 3, 5 to 6. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. That's the NASB version. So, um, you know, again, just going back and looking over my life there and, and looking at the point where I memorized that verse there. And, you know, I was in a bad way at that time. Um, and basically that verse spoke to me. It says, OK, you've been trusting in your own your own understanding all this time. Now you need to trust in God. And I will say that that verse went a long way in, in helping me out of the muck and mire that I was in at that time to uh, be where I am now. OK. So. Second Peter. Second Peter 3.18, grow in grace in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You grow in grace and his knowledge, you got it right there. Yeah. You got it all right there. That's why when uh, I quoted the last scripture about my pastor from Jeremiah 3.15, you know, I will give you pastors who are after my own heart and will give you the knowledge and understanding. This pastor over here, and I'm, you know, I know him as a pastor, but I, I don't worship him as no God, but that's my pastor. God is using this man Amen. in his knowledge and wisdom. Yes. 
And I'm not trying to boast or brag, but I see it. I don't know if you see it in your spiritual eyes or not, but I see it in my spiritual eyes how God is using him and how the church is going forward. Amen. He's a walking seminary, y'all. <laughs> My favorite scripture and is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. Because sometimes things don't feel good and things don't look good. But the second part of that scripture that reminds me that God is working it all for my good. Mm -hmm. Because I've been called according to his purpose, and I believe that. And so that's definitely my favorite scripture, and that's my life scripture. You know, things happen. The doctors say things. Yeah. Stuff happens. Yeah. and But I know it's all working together, and I have to trust him. Trust and believe that it's all going to work out for my good. Good. Um, my cousin, Lorraine, probably 90 or so now, but even 15, 20 years ago, um, there's a poem that probably takes her every bit of 12 to 15 minutes to recite. And uh, so I wouldn't say every year, but frequently she would get asked to do her poem. I think it might be Langston Hughes or something like that. And she would just stand up and do this poem for memory. And I got jealous because I'm saying, if somebody her age can do this poem from memory, then you can learn scripture. Mm -hmm. I think she learned it when she was in grade school, she yeah. said. Now, she says the older she gets, she'll have to go back and rehearse that in order to be able to get up and do it in front of people. And so I then made up my mind, and it took me months that I was going to learn the 24th Psalm from verse 1 all the way through the end. And um, I did realize the other day when I looked at it that I was missing verse 5. But I just studied it and studied it until I could do it. And then I forget where I was. And somebody asked me to read scripture. And nobody had a Bible close by. And I just said, oh. I know Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And who, he who has clean hands, or stand, who, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord or stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity. I just did all the verses of it and just kept going. But it wasn't like I was showing off. It just was, Hey, I, I made up my mind, I'm going to learn Psalm 24. All of us know Psalm 23, mm -hmm. right? We've memorized the Lord's, uh, the model prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So learning big chunks of scripture is only hard if we tell ourselves it's hard. But it's really not that hard, right? Um, I pledge allegiance to the United States of America <laughs> and to the republic for which it stands, right? You ain't said that stuff in 30 years since you've been in school, but you still remember it, right? So um, that's all that stuff that I think it's seriously looking at what do I need to do in order to commit this to my memory, you know? And uh, I think that's part of that process of I'm going to memorize this and I'm going to be committed to memorizing it. And so I think that will help you because uh, there will be those areas in your life that, as I said earlier, that passage helps to address something that's, that's critical to you. It may be just that that passage is always a reminder to you of who you are. You know? So I think that's going to be um, one of those things that's important. Um, Danita, if you have some questions from online, I'm going to be ready for those in about 10 minutes. Um, here's what we're going to look at, is what role does community support and accountability play in encouraging and uh, sustaining scripture memorization habits? So if a person is going to do well, what is the role of community support 
and accountability? I would definitely say um, that encouragement is priceless, and, and I'll, I'll cite uh, a couple of examples. Uh, I told Deacon Jenkins I was going to snitch on him tonight, so I, I'm going to snitch on him. I'm going to tell you what he did to me one day. Um, oh, yeah, I got to tell it. I had to do the scripture reading one morning, and probably nobody knew that this happened. Only he and I knew it. And he holds my, I normally take my Bible up to the podium so I can read scripture. He held my Bible hostage and said, no, you know that scripture going up there. <laughs> I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> he would not let me take my Bible up there, so I had to get up there. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Shatia, you might remember this because you and I talked about this. this was Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. And I got up there and I spit that whole passage off. But what you didn't know behind the scenes is that he held my Bible hostage. He wouldn't let me take it up there with me. <laughs> Yeah, I did. Oh, you know that scripture. Go ahead up there. You good? Yeah. yeah. Hold on to the Bible tight, too. <laughs> um, the, the second example I will give is, you know, as we were going through studying uh, to, uh, you know, the catechism to become deacon and deaconess, um, you know, we were going twice a week for studying. And definitely uh, having, uh, like, for example, with uh, Deacon Edna Morris, drill sergeant, as I call her, you know, her calling me up or talking to uh, uh, the weeping deacon there, uh, Ralph Winchester, um, you know, just having us, we were going through the same thing and sitting there quizzing each other and making sure that uh, everybody knew each scripture. I mean, we, we gelled as a family and we were determined that we all were going to go over at the same time. Uh, no person was going to be left behind. So that helped out quite a bit there. You know, knowing that, you know, I had their back and they had my back. Good. I had an encounter in here. Pastor Phil was in here preaching, and he was preaching on learning scripture on a Sunday morning. And he said, if anybody that's on my ministry staff or on my deacon board, they should learn between 15 to 20 scriptures, book, chapter, and verse. And I was sitting right here, and I said, man, that's kind of deep there. I had to think about it, and I started doing it. Mm -hmm. So I got some encouragement from him. Now, when I got catechized and uh, went through everything, Deacon Larry, I know you back there, Larry. Reverend Wallace Johnson, is he here? Yep. Uh-huh. And I said, man, is he going to catechize us? Because when he, when he come with you on something, you better have your lunch pack. <laughs> But I stood up there and answered every question he asked me because he gave me encouragement. You know, he calls me Jimmy. Jimmy, I know you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, people in the church will encourage you. Yeah. Yeah. Encourage one another. Yeah. Shouldn't have told on me, though. Man. <laughs> and I'll just reiterate as I started <laughs> off with the discipleship classes are key. Um, when you're in those small group settings, intimate settings, I call them as well, because you're getting to know each other. And we would be, we would have made, let's say we had class on Thursday and we, if we see each other, when we see each other on Sunday, what's Psalm 119 verse 11? What's, mm -hmm. you know, then we, we had to learn the fruit of the spirit and all those. Mm -hmm. And so that's the community support, the community encouragement because we want each other to succeed. And I'm just praying that as a result of these two weeks of Bible study and us talk about talking about memorizing scripture, that we would keep each other accountable, that we will ask each other, are we doing it? And how well are we doing? And maybe we'll get us a partner or two and start, you know, bouncing off each other and helping each other to memorize scripture because it's definitely key to um, your journey in Christ and overcoming any temptations and trials you have in your life because some, you're not going to always have a Bible with you. All right. All right. That's, right. That's true. So you need it in your heart. You need something to keep you going, something to keep you sane. Yeah, I think that and I think the accountability piece, we underscore. Uh, I know folks who will say, if you leave me to myself, I'm probably not going to go walk. Mm -hmm. But I got somebody who's going to walk with me and be checking to go, I'm in the parking lot. Where you at? Right. <laughs> I'm waiting on you. Yeah, I know it's drizzling, but I'm already here. Mm -hmm. 
you know, how far are you from getting here to the parking lot? And now I have an accountability partner from walking or an accountability partner for whatever that might be. I think when it comes to memorizing scripture, it's the same thing to say, okay, both of us have to know this verse by this date, by this time, whatever that is, and uh, that'll help you out. I think the other thing that's going to be critical um, is having a system of going back to review the verses that you've learned. Because if you learn a verse and then you don't go back to review that on a regular basis, you will say in six months, I knew that verse. You know, and so you might be at a place where you're saying, I don't review that verse every day, but I am looking at it once a week or I'm looking at it once a month. And then, so you'll be spending all your time on a verse in a particular week. Then you feel like, okay, I've memorized that verse. That verse gets moved to, it's now reviewed weekly. But then there's another verse that I'm working on daily. And once I know that verse, it gets added to my weekly verses. But then there's going to be some verses that are my weekly verses that go to monthly. I don't need to look at it every day. I don't need to look at it every week. But I do need to review that every month. And that list of verses I'm reviewing in a month, maybe 40, 50 verses that I'm reviewing, because these verses are those that I really do need to have in my heart. So I have verses whether that's the flip card. Um, I will also say for you, you want to get in the habit of saying the address of the verse, that this is Psalm 1, verse 2, and then say the verse, and then after you've said the verse, repeat the address again. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, say the verse, and then after you're done saying the verse, this is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If you do that, it will lock in your memorization. I'm thinking of some things now just to give you to clue. Once you know the verse, then quiz yourself with giving yourself the address. What does this verse say? Because it's easy to say if you tell me, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Oh, it's like, oh, that's Proverbs 3, 5, right? But if you say, okay, give me Proverbs 3, 5, that's a little bit different, right? So one of your, you, you should be quizzing yourself both ways. Quizzing yourself with, this is what the verse says, here's the address, but also quizzing yourself to say, this is the address, what is the verse? So if you have flip cards or index cards, you're putting what the verse says on one side, you're putting the address on the other side. So there are times when you're looking at the address and saying, quote the verse. Then there are times when you're looking at the verse and saying, what's the address for that verse? Because when you talk about apologetics, you talk about witnessing, you're not going to be able to say the Bible says. You want to be able to say Psalm 24 says. Right? You want to be able to quote Leviticus chapter 16 not just the book says. Because unfortunately, people have lied about what's in the Bible. And so now when you say it's in the Bible, they're going, where? Right? The Bible is a huge book. And so you just saying it's in the Bible doesn't work anymore. That's, that's not going to be good enough. Any of you all have questions in, in for, for our panelists? Any of you all in the, in the audience? Um, here have any questions for for our panelists all right here's a question is it best to remember uh, this looks like Patricia Hunter is it best to remember studying by verses or by studying an entire chapter I guess I can go first. I, I, I would say, uh, uh, I'm going to call this a step approach. Uh, I would definitely say studying the verses uh, first and kind of build up to the entire chapter. Now, uh, if you look at uh, Psalm 119, which is the longest uh, <laughs> chapter, I would, that's going to be kind of rough because that's 176 verses. But um, 
Uh, as far as the other ones, you know, if, if you're going to try to study the whole chapter, I would say go stair steps, you know, bit by bit, you know, study one verse at a time. Uh, I do think it's important, um, Patricia, to understand what does that verse mean in its context? Because oftentimes we quote verses out of context. So I need to know what is this chapter about? So when I pull this verse out, that I'm not using that verse in a way that is not what the verse is really saying. Because there are times when people misquote verses and or they quote the verse, but they attribute a meaning to the verse that's not there. You know, um, I'll give you all an example. Y'all can look at this one. Um, First Corinthians chapter two, I think it's verse eight and nine, says something to the effect of eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, um, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Um, but they, if you don't look at verse 10, then that verse means what people try to say it means. But as soon as you look at verse 10, the whole context change. Verse 10 says, but he has revealed them to us by his spirit. So to say, eyes haven't seen, nor ears have heard the things that God has prepared, but he has revealed them. So we're, we're trying to say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, but it's already been revealed to us. So that verse really, I'm not saying we shouldn't ever quote it, but the way the majority of people quote that verse is probably not a way we should quote it. You get what I'm saying? So I don't want to just learn a verse if I'm going to be quoting the verse in a context that's not true. Here's an example. Years ago, my wife hugs a little boy and says, boy, you so crazy. His grandmother decides he's going to sue, sue my wife because she said, boy, you so crazy. I did say that. That's not what I meant. And you know that's not what I meant. So she goes to court saying she called my grandson crazy. You get what I'm saying? You've taken what I've said completely out of context. And there are times when we're guilty of doing that. So I think if I'm learning scripture, I need to understand the context that that verse is in. And it's in understanding that context that I can make sure that I understand what did it mean back then. And once I understand what it means back then, I can apply it to today. Does that make sense? Yeah. If, if I'm, because it's going to look, one, I'm going to look foolish if I'm quoting a verse out of context. But the second probably is even worse. I could look manipulative, like I'm trying to manipulate the people of God or trying to lead the people of God astray. And I don't want to look like that. You don't want to look like that either. So very important to understand the context before I start quoting a verse or memorizing uh, a verse. I want to make sure I got it properly. Yeah, I was going to add one more to that, Pastor. I, I think one of the verses that gets quoted quite often is, uh, I believe it's James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. But also, if you go back to Matthew 6, 33, seek ye the kingdom first. You know, if, if you're asking for something in a selfish manner, then you're kind of, you're, you're taking the James 4, 2 out of context, and you're not following what it's mentioning in, in uh, Matthew 6, 33. Right, right. Okay. Did you have another question from, from online? No? Okay. Um, is there, when, when, when you think about the person who is trying to get started, they, they haven't done good, they haven't even thought about it. This, these last two weeks is the first time they've ever thought about memorizing scripture. Where would you advise them to start? I would say start at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Okay. Work on rightly dividing the word of truth and the word of God. You start right there. Everything should be smooth sailing. I mean, it's still going to be hard. Yeah. And memorizing scripture. But start right there. Study. 
study to show yourself approved, not to man, yeah. but to God. Yeah. I would uh, add to that, um, if you look up the verses that comprise the uh, Roman Rose of Salvation, I okay. would add that to it as well. Okay. Um, and I would, I would want to add the Psalms and Proverbs, because a lot of those scriptures just flow, and they talk about just life, you know, in general. So I would say, you know, also can take some scriptures from the Psalms and Proverbs. Right. I would not start off with... Um, big chunks of verses. Uh, I would definitely pick verses that are simple to understand and don't have very complicated con concepts. You know, uh, Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law does he meditate, meditate day and night. You, you would take something really simple like that. It's not complicated. It's very easy to walk along with. And as I was doing it, uh, Sister Dana was uh, quoting that right along with me. But that's one of those ones that's not hard, right? I can remember it's Psalm 1, verse 1. I'm going to start right there. John 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, verse 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ain't that complicated? I, I, I know that one. You get what I'm saying? So if I'm starting to do that, those would be verses that I think would help you along the way as you begin this process of memorizing Scripture because you don't want to go, like if, if I was um, trying to learn a new hobby, I'm not going to start with the hardest part of the hobby. They, they're going to give me, they're going to work you up to the parts that's hard. Don't start trying to memorize the most complicated verses or the longest passage of scripture. You know, I'm, I'm going to start with a verse that it isn't too complicated in order to be able to memorize that. Because again, you're giving yourself the best, uh, you're giving yourself the ability to begin to memorize, um, but to also give yourself some confidence as you're memorizing scripture. You don't want to start off, be defeated as you're trying. So pick verses that aren't that challenging. And then as you start getting the simple verses under your belt, then you can work your way up. So Psalm 119 verse 11 it, it, it's a verse that's not too complicated, right? If I really spend some time on it, three or four days, I got that verse. And I think that'll be one of them that really is beneficial for you. Deacon Ralph. Uh, I thank y'all for uh, panelists. I also thank y'all for, for giving me hope because this brain is fried and trying to really make my speech. <laughs> Look, sir, a mind is a terrible thing to face. <laughs> and I, I wasted some brain cells. So, <laughs> so I just want to thank y'all. But, I, you know, for me, myself, I, I try not to use the fact that not um, growing up in the church and having a late start in getting uh, becoming a follower of Christ. So I try not to use that as, a, uh, as an excuse any, any longer. But what I try to do, um, I do have a question. One is that, well, a statement first. One is that I would tell anybody that's trying to memorize uh, scripture to not get discouraged. Because sometimes people are quoting scripture that you might not even be familiar with, where it's coming from as far as the, um, what text or what book it's coming from. So it's good to just memorize scripture um, as it applies to you or, or the best that you can. One of the questions I have is that how, how important is it to know um, the character of the Bible where there are certain scriptures based on um, writers of the books or, or where that's, you know, um, the characters uh, such as uh, David, what, you know, something that, that he's written in the New Testament, Matthew or something like that. So how important is that? knowing the character. Okay. I would say that it's, um, it's very important because then it gives you clues to the context. You know, like David, Psalm 51. You can just read that, but you need to know the history behind that. That's right. 
his sin, what he did. Why is he saying, you know, it's against you, oh God, that I've on, that I've sinned and wash me, clean me, you know, then I can show others. So I think it's very important to know the context. A lot of Paul's writings, you have to know that he was, he had been shipwrecked. He was, they were trying to kill him. You know, there was so much going on in his life. And, you know, he wrote Philippians from prison. He in prison, writing a letter, encouraging other people. So it's, you know, it's just really, it's good to know the character in the background of the writer so that you can, you can walk in their shoes almost, you know, see, you know, why, you know, the why to their writings. And me and Tig and Tim was discussing that in the, the lobby about the, the characteristics of David in Psalm 51. We just talking about why that was because he sent the man to get killed because of the sin that he did. Mm -hmm. He committed sin, mm -hmm. you know, adultery, and sent your eyes to the front line to be killed. Mm -hmm. And me and Tim were just talking about that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna uh, the direction I'm gonna go as far as uh, the the story of the demoniac legion. Now that's across all three of the synoptic gospels. And if you read uh, Mark and Luke, those two versions of that story track very close. But if you read Matthew, there's a lot of detail that's in that version that's not in the other two Gospels there. So understanding that Matthew was a tax collector and he's probably a, a lot more detail there, that, that kind of helped me to put into context, okay, this is probably why there's a lot more stuff here versus uh, the Mark and the Luke version. Yeah. Um, I remember memorizing... Um, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness neither unto him. Neither can they know them, for they are spiritually discerned. I knew that verse and had memorized it, but didn't understand it. And then I remember one day reading that verse again, and it jumped out to me that the spiritually discerned, I didn't, I didn't get that part. The things of the Spirit of God are spiritually understood. But a person who is natural doesn't have the capacity to understand something that's of the Spirit. This is an outdated, this is an outdated, well, I can update, I can update this. It's, it's a person... I was going to use a transistor radio, but that's that nobody knows. We, Wendy don't even know what that is. But um, <laughs> it's, it's having a broadcast on XM or Sirius, but you got an old car that don't even have XM or Sirius in it. So you may have a radio, but you don't have the capacity to get XM. You don't have the capacity to get Sir Sirius. So... It's, it's not that it's not being broadcast. Your car doesn't have the capacity to receive XM stations. Does that make sense? Yep. The things that are coming from the Spirit of God are, are, are understood. They're discerned in the Spirit. A person who is natural, who has not been born again, does not have. They like a car that don't have XM. It's not that XM is not right there. You just don't have it. And so I knew the verse, had memorized it, but that verse wasn't as powerful to me as it could be because I didn't understand completely what that verse meant. All right. Um, That's one of the survival kit verses. Yes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Um, I'm a mess this person's name up. I think it's weeds. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guess. If it's not, I guess it's Odes, maybe. Uh, should I try to learn both the Old Testament and the New Testament at the, at the same time? I would say yes. Uh, you should be learning uh, verses um, from, from both of them because uh, you won't really understand the New Testament if I'm not knowledgeable of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament doesn't make sense if I don't continue to look at the New Testament. And so you don't want to 
be one of those persons who only knows the New Testament. So if you're learning Psalms and you're learning Proverbs, you're learning the Old Testament. Um, but there are going to be some powerful pieces um, that are in the, the uh, Old Testament. Um, but the Proverbs are packed with verses uh, to learn. The Proverbs and the Psalms. Um, Psalms are very uplifting. So Psalm 34, verse 19, Psalm 27, Psalm 46. Um, what's Psalm 46? Uh, uh, why am I drawing a complete blank on? Uh, no. Psalm, uh, God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of of trouble. That's that's Psalm uh, 46. So, I, or is, it, is that Psalm 40? I don't remember. 46. Okay. So you want to be in a place where you are memorizing all of those. So Old Testament, New Testament. Recently, I preached from Genesis, and uh, I think it's chapter five, verse eight. Verse is very simple. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Yeah. That, that verse jumped out to me, that there's all these rotten people, but there's this verse that says no matter how bad the people were, Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time memorizing that verse. That verse just resonated with me from the very first time I got ready to preach it. And so I think that's going to be um, one of those that's critical for us to, to be at. Why am I memorizing this verse? Not just randomly picking verses to mem memorize, but this verse, I'm memorizing this verse for a specific reason. There's something this verse is going to do for me when I memorize it. Yeah, I, I would uh, add to that. If, if you look at, there's, there's a couple of verses that kind of jump out in my mind from the Old Testament that kind of explains Jesus is coming. Uh, one is Micah 5.2. Uh, the other would be Isaiah 9, 6. Um, Micah 5, 2 explains, of course, you know, where uh, Jesus would be born. Um, and then, of course, uh, 9, 6, you know, explains uh, pretty much everything that he would go through. So that kind of puts into context um, when Jesus is talking about the fact that, you know, he had to fulfill the scriptures there because all of that stuff was foretold in the Old Testament. Yeah. Good. Can I, can I quote you Isaiah 9, 6? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Unto us a child is born. Yes. Unto us a son is a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Huh? Yep. Uh, and, and he should be called Wonderful, Counselor, Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Peace. Amen. See, the Old Testament talks about the coming, like he was saying, the coming right. of Christ. Right. So it's good to learn the Old Testament scriptures and everything, too. Right. So I will say read old and new, because yep. another part is in Isaiah 61, where it talks about he came to seek to heal the uh, sick and the blind and set captivity free. And then you look in Luke chapter 4, verse 17, it says the same thing. Mm -hmm. He came to give deliverance to the sick and the blind and, let, and set captivity free. Yeah. So it's good to go back and forth through old and new. I, I love the Old Testament. Yeah. 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 I, I, I have to admit that for years, I really only preached the New Testament. And then I realized the Old Testament is just harder to preach. You know, you got to preach bigger chunks of scripture. Uh, Deacon Ralph, you had something else you want to bring up? When studying scripture, is it is it good or to go, you have various translation, ESV, King James, NIV. Is it good to go, from, go uh, balance from one to another or should you just stick with one um, translation? when you're trying to memorize, because each one's words are different. I'm going to say whatever. Um, so here's my challenge. Um, I grew up in an old school church, and King James was king. So until I started pastoring, I was preaching and teaching all exclusively from King James. So most of what I learned 20 to 30 years ago, 
I can't unlearn that because it's King James. It's just, that's what's in there. That's what's going to be in there, right? That's like Prego is in there. <laughs> um, but as I'm memorizing scripture now, I'm committing to a modern English translation because I find that easier than ye shall not fulfill. But that's what I know, right? So um, visiteth and all of that just, uh, that just makes it cumbersome for me. So um, because I don't know anybody who visiteth anyone today, right? That's, that's a 400 year old language. So I don't want to memorize something that's 400 years old, but that's not to say for the next person. So I think it's an individual choice what a person, I think a person has to ask, which one of these is going to be, one, do I understand the most? Two, is the easiest for me to memorize? Three, is the easiest for me to maintain? Right? Do I understand it? Can I memorize it quickly? And then once I've memorized it, can I hold on to what I memorized? If one version gives you a much harder time, then I don't see the purpose in memorizing from that version if it, if it ain't going to be one that helps me to get it quickly, hold on to it, and, um, and then maintain it over a long period of time. The only thing I would add to that is make sure, as Pastor always says, and I'm shocked he didn't mention it, that you're not learning a paraphrase, that you're actually learning a version. Yeah. A word by word translation that you're not learning something that has omitted something or just kind of put it in their words. Right. You know, make sure that your version is a true version. So that's not to throw shade on right. the Message Bible, because, it's not to yeah. throw shade on the Good News Bible. Those are good to read, but I understand they're paraphrases. Mm -hmm. This is someone, Peterson's. Peterson's Message Bible is good to read, but this is somebody saying, this is my take on what the Bible says, as opposed to this is what the Bible says, right? This is them saying, um, this is not. Um, so, Tim, you was going to say something, then I'll jump to this question here from, from Trina. Okay, uh, I was going to say that uh, um, the NIV is my baseline, but uh, sometimes I'm going into a um, version comparison where you can like line up three or four different versions, and and if one of those versions of a particular scripture grabs me a little bit better, I'm like, okay, all right, I'll use that one. But for the most part, um, I use uh, NIV, uh, NIV as my baseline. Uh, also, I was I was going to kind of throw this in here in terms of uh, I can remember uh, starting the uh, catechism packet uh, over at Edgewood, and we came over here, and, and all that stuff I learned in NIV, <laughs> I had to learn it in King James Version when I got here, so I had to start all over again. Yeah. So this is uh, Trina Winchester. Is the King James Version the only complete Bible, and the NIV is missing something or scriptures? So, no. Uh, it's a good question. The, the, the challenge is the King James was translated from one set of manuscripts. The NIV, ESV, New Revised Standard Version, NRSV, NASV, and there's so many of them. Like the, It's the alphabet soup when it comes to translations of the Bible. What's important is to understand is that they are not, they're not translated from the same manuscripts. So I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but I think this is an important question that I should spend some time with. So there is no original version of the Bible. What we have are fragments of the Bible. They have, um, like we don't have, let's just take Isaiah, for instance. We have pieces of Isaiah. So we have the whole book of Isaiah. 
But there was no place that they found all of Isaiah. They found part of Isaiah chapter maybe 24 through 36. And then they found somewhere else. They got another piece of it and another piece of it. And then they've got all of Isaiah, all of Malachi and so forth and so on. So they have all of those transcripts and they use those transcripts to translate modern English version. The King James version, however, is 400 years ago translated and King James is translated from Latin. And the Latin was translated from Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So catch this now. The original Bible is translated. There's one set of man manuscripts that's translated from Hebrew, translated from Greek, translated from Aramaic, into Latin, and then after they had the Latin Bible, they determined that they wanted an English Bible. So the King James Version of the Bible is a translation of a translation. The modern English Bibles are not using the manuscripts that the King James Bible was translated from. They're using other, tra other manuscripts. Therefore, those it's not original. We don't have any original Bibles. All we have are copies of the Bible. So when, when we say we're, they were translating Paul's letter, they're, they're translating a copy of Paul's letter. There's nowhere that we can get one of Paul's original letters. Make sense? We don't have James's original letters. We have copies of James's letter, right? So they had what they called circular letters. They'd send the letter perhaps to Ephesus. When the letter got to Ephesus, they would make a copy of it, except they didn't have a Xerox machine. They wrote it. And then when they made their copy, they would send it on to Philippi. And then when it got there, they did what? Made a copy of it. So now you have a copy of it in Ephesus. You have a copy of it in, in uh, Colossae. You have a copy of it in Rome. You have a copy here. And when they put all those pieces of copies together, like we got the whole thing, but there are pieces that aren't in the manuscripts that make up the NIV, the ESV in those modern day translations. So when, when people say, well, part of the NIV is missing, they're saying what the King James Version had, the manuscripts that they were looking at, it wasn't there. Right. So they're saying we're not going to translate a verse that the King James Version had because the manuscript we're looking at don't have that verse. That makes sense. So it, let's just say. Um, look at the very end of Mark. So, so somebody grab Mark chapter 16. While they're grabbing that and Mark chapter 16, I think, goes to verse eight, according to the NIV. But then there'll be some other translations like the King James that says Mark chapter 16 goes beyond that. And they're saying we're, we don't have anything to say about the, the manuscripts that the King James Version was translated from. We are saying that the modern day translation did not have manuscripts that had those verses in it. Does that make sense? So does anybody have Mark 8, Mark 16? Yes. Where's, where's the stop? Okay, so the NIV was translated from manuscripts that have Mark chapter 16 up through verse 8. If you look at the King James Version, it'll go through verse 20. So there'll be some who say the, the NIV ain't a good Bible because it don't have all the verses. And they're saying we have a lot of manuscripts that don't have verse 9 through 20. So we didn't put it in there. The only way they would have been able to get nine through 20 was to go to the King James and pull that. But if you're making a translation of manuscripts and the manuscripts you have don't have it, why would you put it in? Does that make sense? 
Yes. Say that again. Okay. Is there any notes there that says? It should be some, a note. Yeah. Usually they'll say some manuscripts or some. There's usually some kind of note there. Do you see anything, Shatia? You was going to say something. I'm just going to ask, um, follow up to the question that I had. That Well, the statement that I made. The NIV was translated from the original. That's When I say original, I mean like the Greek, the Aramaic, and the Hebrew. Hebrew, right. Yes. So there, that's the major difference between all the modern, all the modern language, modern English translations, like the ESV, the NIV, New Revised Standard, New American Standard, they are not going to the King James. They are going past the King James. They're going all the way back to the oldest manuscripts they can find. The King James was, was translated in 1600. So it's about 400 years ago. So they're not translating today from the King James. They're going all the way back to Hebrew all the way back to Greek, and then occasionally there's some Aramaic. So they are translating from manuscripts that are much older than the King James Version. Here's what makes this important. Um, in 1947, um, in some caves in Qumran, which is down near the Red Sea, the, the Dead Sea, I should say, um, were called the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have the Dead Sea Scrolls under lock and key, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are 99.9% .9 with what the modern Bible says today. So they are finding a piece here and there, but for folks to say man wrote the Bible, they found in a cave in our lifetime. If you don't believe me, Google will back, back me up. I, I, I'm saying this and Google agrees with me. It's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of y'all were born before 1947. So in, in our lifetime, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and they have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they are going back to compare the Bible. They went back to compare the Bible to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's accurate. So all this manipulation that people talk about, man wrote the Bible, the Bible's been manipulated, all that stuff is lies. Um, so, um, and again, they, 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 the, the scrolls were hidden in a cave and they just stumbled upon them. They were, they were in, in, um, clay jars and of course being that old, they were fragile, but they've pieced them all together to say they've got, uh, they've got the Bible. Uh, I'm going to go to, uh, Kelvin and then we'll take this off. You can go ahead. I'm also, um, Pastor, I, um, I'm, I'm very stickler about this, right? Always try to consult the Holy Spirit before you even study anything. Right, right. Because it won't resonate into your spirit and your heart. Right. Um, the second thing is that when the books of the Bible was written um, in different languages, there were, there were in Arabic, um, Greek, or what, whatnot, there were different languages and words that um, did not pertain to them at the time. Like, what's in Arabic was in Arabic, but they never used the Greek language to, if you understand me, it, it, to um, whatever the words that were in the Greek language, some was taken out because it didn't matter to them in Arabic, like whatever words they're using. Does that make sense? It does, but I'm, here's, so when I took French in eighth grade, we say, what time is it? French don't have a phrase like that. They are asking, what hour is it? Keller Atil is not, what time is it? But when they translate, what time is it, to French, it's, what hour is it? In French, you're saying, you, in English, we're saying, my name is. In French, they're saying, they call me. You get what I'm saying? But it's not a word for word. It's, 
but it's a translation. This is what we mean. So, you know, there's, but it's like that with anything. One of my favorite lines from the movie Amistad is, um, I can't remember who the president was, but he's saying um, something is almost. And he said, we don't have a word for that. It either is or it's not. <laughs> we don't have almost like you no. Know, so I just remember in that movie that that there's, you know, as you're trying to make a translation, you're trying the best as you can, right? So when you say in our language, something costs an arm and a leg, that's an idiom. How do you translate that into another language? You get what I'm saying? So they're doing the best they can when they're when they're translating it. Um, Take that. Before you dive into memorizing, this is uh, Turner. Before you dive, and maybe Paulette Turner, maybe before you dive into memorizing scripture, is it important that you take the time to figure out which translation you memorize as well as which of the books you start with? Yes, it's, it's very important to start with there. And again, I wouldn't start with the hardest translation. Um, and I know for some of us, we hold King James, you know, tight to vest. Pastor Ben, I say nothing because I'm going to keep my King James. If that, I'm not telling you what to do if you want to keep your King James, but it don't make sense if it's hard to learn, hard to memorize. That don't really make sense. Yes, and then we got to go. Okay, I'm asking this question in part for the covenant community of Southern Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. And I want to be very transparent about saying that because to a great degree with the topic. First, thank you very much for your panel and the effort of what you're doing to have us know the importance of this. But as a church, we're pretty much babies when it comes down to the practice of this, the actual function of it, the impact of it. And my question to the panel or my request of the panel is, how do we get the church to be transparent about their actual knowledge and skill level of this, but then have a desire for this. I, I would say, as I said twice already, the transparency comes with getting into these classes where you have to memorize scripture and doing it. And I think that's an issue with some people. They feel like they're of a certain age. They're of, they've been in the church for 20, 25 years, so they don't want to take this class. Oh, that's survival kit. That's one of the first class, spiritual class. Yes, get into it. Take it. Start memorizing scripture. You know, it's going to be some stuff in there that you learn. It's going to be some stuff that the light bulb goes off and you say, thank you, Jesus, because I never knew this. And I think it just takes some humility oh, to be able to do that. It's going to take some humility. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm telling you, it'll change your life. That humility will change your life. You're going to wonder why you waited so long to do it. So I think that that's the, the turning point. If you want to know it, if you feel like, if you want to be transparent, and you want to be honest with yourself and everyone else, get into the class. I was going to say, if I, I completely agree with Lady Toledo, it is humility. This, has, this is God. You, there's something you expect of me. And I'm going to let my pride get in the way of moving to where you want me to be. That's first. But even if I am prideful and I don't want people to know, I can begin to learn scripture privately. I can partner with someone to say, I want you and me to learn. Nobody in my church know that I don't know scripture. But I'm beginning to build up my arsenal of verses that I have memorized so that they never know that I didn't know. So I could be a year from now with knowing 20 verses and folks go, oh, girl, you know scripture. Yeah, I know scripture. They, you don't know. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know anything in April, but we get to the end of the year and I know a whole bunch of verses. So you you, you just can't if, if you have an ego in our faith, it doesn't work. It's a high level of humility that it takes. And I think it's through that humility and the Somehow we have convinced people that living for Jesus is easy. So when we start looking at the things that are challenging, like fasting, like praying, 
like living holy, memorizing scripture, closing your mouth and not saying what you feel like saying and keeping your hand at your side and not swipe, sw um, swatting at people and all that. We, we act like, like it isn't challenging, but it is challenging. And so when we get to a place where we're going memorizing scripture is hard, it is. But you can do it if you have a heart to please God. I think that's got to be the, the foremost. Uh, we, we're, we're two minutes over, so would y'all help me to I think? I want to say quickly, even if you're a leader, take the class to be able to teach the class. If you've never, you know, been in the class before or you might want to teach it, take it to teach it. Yeah. I'll say one thing, too. Okay. Reverend Johnson always says it's in the house. It's in the house. When you want to learn something, if somebody come to you, uh, Deacon Tim came to me and told me about a class on unsung people in the Bible. So he said, would you like to be in? I said, yeah. He said, would you like to teach in? I said, yeah. And I took the challenge. And I, first of all, I asked him what the verses that people talked about. So once he told me everybody talked about, I said, well, I'm going to bring you some verses where people did not talk about. So I took the challenge, but but like I say, you know, you got to want this thing, you know, you got to want to know Lord, more about the Lord. That's why you got Sunday schools and Bible study. Right. I, I love Sunday school when I he got some dynamite people that's doing ministers doing Sunday school, like Minister Robinson. And, you know, I called him through the week and say, hey, what Sunday school lesson on? When he gave me the lesson and gave me the verses, I start on the verses, but then I read that whole chapter. Right. You know, because anywhere where you see therefore, there's something else before that. Oh, what yeah. You read. Would y'all help me celebrate our panelists tonight? Y'all yeah. give us hearts and thumbs up and, and all that on the screen there at, at your place. We're grateful for you. I want to personally, on behalf of all of us here, thank you, uh, Deacon Harris and Deacon Robinson and Minister Grayton for helping us uh, tonight. I hope it was beneficial for you, gave you something else to think about. Father in heaven, we bless you for this uh, time together tonight. I pray, oh God, that as you have challenged us to not only live holy, but challenged us to learn your word and to hide your word in our hearts. I'm reminded of the psalmist who says, order, your step, order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Lead me and guide me every day. So, God, we want to be led by your word. Help us, oh God, from top to bottom, from greatest to youngest, uh, to memorize your scripture and, Lord, to hide it deep in our hearts. We bless you. We ask, oh God, for traveling mercy as we go home from here. We pray in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.